2013 has been an important year for construction products. Um, with the change from the uh, CPD, the Construction Products Directive, to the CPR, the Construction Products Regulation. Um, today's guest, uh, Harm Verster, has been involved in preparing amendments and now uh, is involved with uh, their implementation. Good day, Harm. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Great to, to see and speak to you again. Long time no see. Long time no see. Last time we spoke, uh, I think we spoke each other in uh, in Moscow, in Russia. That's true. Yeah, great times. That's true. Um, Harm, maybe you can explain a little bit um, who Harm Verster is and um, how you have been involved in preparation and implementation of uh, amendments to the CPR and the CPD. Well, I will give the shot. Um, I'm just an ordinary guy who came along in the field like many of ours and I got involved in quality management and then you go into uh, standardization, uh, certification and then you end up in a certification institute and before you know you're involved in explaining rules and legislation and in the end you are working for a government, uh, in this case our member state uh, Holland, uh, but also I was involved in advising and consulting other uh, governments uh, around the world. Um, so I'm just an ordinary guy, uh, came along and found my way across uh, this whole field of legislation. And the most important thing is that most people think of uh, CE marking just as something technical, but most people forget the background. Almost no one uh, is aware of what happened in the past decades since we started the, the union of uh, countries in Europe, mm -hmm. starting with six countries and uh, joining more and more member states than the, the uh, Treaty of uh, Lisbon, of course. Yeah. Um, and everybody forgets what's all behind. And what, what is most behind? important. And that's yeah, that, that's that's uh, very typical. We're not talking about technical issues as they are. We're talking about economical uh, motives. Mm -hmm. That was the starting of the EU or predecessor, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. There was an urge to have an economic cooperation between countries, which started with steel and coal. You may remember. Uh, you of course had this background. But oh, I'm not that old. <laughs> nor am I, but many things are written down and some treaties, you can find them wherever uh, you, you look. Internet is a very good source and every information is available. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the principles, it's just for economic reasons that we have started all this, this legislation, joining forces. Mm -hmm. And what was the most important uh, aspect of the uh, Lisbon Treaty? That was that we were talking about the functioning of the union. Mm -hmm. How has it to be organized, uh, governed? And if you look at that, then you come into a legal context. With, it's just a legal context of economic motives. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, it has to be very clear that we are doing all this, this work for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Talking the same language mm -hmm. uh, throughout whole Europe and even... Uh, outside Europe. So um, we, we will go into this a little bit more detail, but uh, one of the reasons that you were uh, involved uh, in, uh, in amending the, the CPD to become the CPR uh, is actually to make the system work better. Is that correct? Um, yes, partly that's correct. Uh, first of all, there was, of course, the Construction Products Directive. Mm -hmm. And as in the name, it's was just a directive how you should work mm -hmm. and you know the discussions within Europe when do you use the word should or shall or could or might or perhaps mm -hmm. and I said I used the word should mm -hmm. and the, lo the logic behind it was quite clear to a few people mm -hmm. but it was not really enforced and, and that was one of the uh, disadvantages of the directive so, for a very good reason, uh, there was a need for a regulation mm -hmm. to be more specific, 
uh, to be more in, uh, imposing this new system mm -hmm. because there was a very good background, there still is. Mm -hmm. The reasons why we have CE marking are very legitimate, mm -hmm. but it has had to be enforced stronger, mm -hmm. had to be more vivid uh, among the people, mm -hmm. and that's also one of the reasons why you have the regulation instead of the directive. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of manufacturers knew about CE marking. A lot of manufacturers had applied to CE marking, yeah. but it was just the manufacturers. And what we forgot in the whole um, effort was that there, if you only uh, provide CE marking and the other parties, the, the people buying those products, using those products, have no clue what to do with this information, mm -hmm. then it will not work. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the biggest changes between the, from the CPD to the CPR, to the regulation. Mm -hmm. And the regulation is much more specific to other parties involved. Mm -hmm. So the, the importers, the distributors, the, uh, the people who really design and use information. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the system, it's about a harmonized way of sharing information. Yes. The information you draw up as a manufacturer about your product, mm -hmm. it has to be understood in every uh, member state of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, what we had in the past. A lot of information uh, provided by manufacturers, very often supported by uh, voluntary marks. But each country had its own system. Mm -hmm. What we did in Europe was uh, set a framework of harmonization mm -hmm. that whenever I made a statement about my product in one member state, it will be understood in the same way in another member state. Mm -hmm. hold so on. That, that was the reason behind it. Hold, hold on. Maybe, maybe it's good to explain. Uh, 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 maybe it's a, a very technical legal uh, um, uh, difference between uh, directive and uh, regulations. Maybe it's good to, to, to explain that a little bit. Um, the European Commission has cho chosen traditionally uh, as as the as the legal instrument to um, to build a system uh, and to to um, uh, to set set the requirements for products, uh, they chose the instrument of a directive, and um, a directive um, has this. Uh, what is specific about a directive is that it needs to be transposed into national legislation. So that means that the text of the directive does not directly affect. Um, the companies who are working, or the manufacturers who are working in in a certain member state, but uh, they have to uh, they have to use their national legislation. And what we have seen over the last uh, few few years um, is that uh, slowly but surely uh, differences of interpretation were uh, laid down in the uh, the national laws and regulations of of the member states and that we had different interpretations of what the requirements were. So to give you one to give one example is um, the affixing of the CE marking. It was until uh, this year, the summer of this year, that in the United Kingdom, there was no legal requirement to affix the CE marking to a uh, construction product, correct? That's correct. Yes. And, and uh, the regulation... Yeah, completely right. And the regulation is is uh, does not have to be transposed uh, through uh, national uh, uh, legislation. It has direct effect in uh, in the member states, and therefore this is a tool to um, to ensure that there is uh, there are no longer these differences of uh, of interpretation. Correct. You are absolutely correct, and if you that's that's why I mentioned the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. As you may remember, this uh, was uh, drafted in 2009, mm -hmm. and if we're talking about CE mark in the construction sector, that was uh, originally from 89. So mm -hmm. only 20 years afterwards, we had the legal framework within this, what you just uh, explained, mm -hmm. was settled. Yes, the uh, individual member states had to implement uh, the CE marking in the national legislation, mm -hmm. which worked out differently in the, uh, several member states. Mm -hmm. And now it was enforced by uh, means of the regulation. And if you look into the Treaty on the Functioning of the uh, uh, European Union, uh, I thought it was Article 268. You can find the difference between uh, directive mm -hmm. and regulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're completely right. 
uh, we needed to improve the harmonization which we had started almost 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But there was another reason to uh, to make the transfer from a directive to a regulation, correct? There were more more technical reasons, so to speak. Um, there are a lot of technical reasons also, but the starting point was the economic motive. Mm -hmm. You had to build a framework uh, with the uh, legal setting. Um, and the most important part, of, in my opinion, most um, impressive part, what they have managed, was the, the responsibility, which was quite clear um, in the past under the directive. As a manufacturer, of course, you had some responsibility for your product. Mm -hmm. Now you're just responsible and anyone having a claim, uh, you're legally bound to whatever you have stated about your product. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole responsibility setting for each party in the, in the whole chain from manufacturer until the works, mm -hmm. that's one very important aspect, uh, knows its entire responsibility. Mm -hmm. They so may not like it, mm -hmm. they may not like it, I don't mm -hmm. care. But at least it is clear, it is defined, yeah. and no one can say, well, I'm not to blame because your responsibilities are very well defined. Mm -hmm. So the clarification of the, the legal responsibilities of the economic operators who are involved in the whole uh, process from, let's say, design till uh, placing on the market of products, um, distribution. Even further than that, yes. even further. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at uh, the CPD, it was about the products as they are. If you look at the regulation, it's not just the products as they are, it's about what their function is in the works, in the mm -hmm. building, or whatever you uh, like to call it. And they're talking about works. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the fun fundamental... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just lost the word. Uh, <laughs> Just try to translate from Dutch again into English. That, that the term. essential requirements? No, no, no. Forget about the essential requirements. It's uh, uh, the fundamental uh, requirements for uh, the works, mm -hmm. the basic work requirements. Mm -hmm. And you're not talking about a product with a certain dimension, mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. That's what your state is the, mm -hmm. the maybe, product. Maybe you're talking about what, what's the essence, what's the use of the product, what does it mean towards the works? Mm -hmm. That's let's, what you're talking about. Let's let's uh, back up a little bit. Um, let, let's highlight this because I think this is uh, very important. Um, the construction product regulation, like the directive before, is not a very typical CE marking directive, uh, correct? And maybe that's good to explain that a little bit because there are, you know, the fundamental differences in um, in the requirements, but also in procedures. Uh, typically, a CE marking directive sets essential safety requirements for products. Um, yeah. How is this with the CPR? And um, well, that, that's indeed a very big difference. The CPR is about products which you do not function as they are when you buy them on the market. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about uh, uh, toys or medical devices, whenever you buy such a product, it's ready to use immediately. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to uh, put a plug in, in, the, in the socket, but it will work immediately. A construction product will not function in itself. You have to treat it, you have to handle it, you have to incorporate it into a building. Mm -hmm. And only then it will perform as it was intended to perform. And so the there are safety requirements. There were safety requirements in the construction products directive, but these were not mm -hmm. safety requirements for the construction materials, construction products themselves. But these were safety requirements for the buildings in which these products are going to be used. Correct? Um, yes. And... and in general, yes, but don't forget there are also some requirements about the safety of the products themselves. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at uh, dangerous substances, if you have a toxic uh, product, it reflects the product itself and not okay. so much mm -hmm. in the works. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about mechanical uh, requirements on the works, mm -hmm. then a product can play its part. But not necessarily that it, it has that role. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, sound uh, insulation, yes. sound absorption. Yes. A product can have a role in it, but uh, 
also it can be non-existent for this uh, specific product. Mm -hmm. So you have there are some requirements uh, considering um, risks, mm -hmm. dangers. Mm -hmm. And mechanical stability is one of the uh, principal uh, fundamentals of works, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, environment, hygiene, safety in use, safety in case of fire. There are several topics, yes. and some items reflect the product, some items reflect the works in which they are incorporated. Mm -hmm. So that is a complete different set than just assessing one product as it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can, uh, in this regard, also explain the difference between what we traditionally do, that we do traditionally in uh, the more uh, traditional CE marking directives. That is, you end the process by declaring conformity um, to the directive. And how is how is this in the CPR? You declare not conformity, but you declare performance. Uh -huh. Correct. Correct. And that, that's the whole issue. And that's indeed, uh, again, the difference between other directives and the uh, construction forest regulation. Because you declare something at the end. The question is, what do you declare? You declare a performance, mm -hmm. not uh, conformity, because that was CPD time. We mm -hmm. declared conformity. Now we express a performance which is anticipated. Mm -hmm under certain con uh, circumstances, certain mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of examples. You mm -hmm. can make a statement about a product, mm -hmm. but the performance will only happen when it's incorporated in the building. Yes. And the the, the fa most uh, famous uh, example I have is fire-resistant glass. Mm -hmm. Beautiful product. A lot of manufacturers produce it. Officially, it does not exist because there's no standard for fire-resistant glass. Mm -hmm. No, there is just a product which can provide fire resistance. Then you say, okay, we have this, this uh, product which provides fire resistance. Mm -hmm. Can it work? No, it can only work when it's incorporated in the building in the appropriate way. In a way it has, that has been demonstrated by the manufacturer under these circumstances, it will work. Mm -hmm. to, to give you a little bit more uh, normal explanation, mm -hmm. if you have a fire-resistant glass, as we call it, yes. you place it into a steel framework, you can imagine that when there is a fire, the steel framework will hold out for some time. Mm -hmm. The product, fire-resistant glass, is performing as it should. Mm -hmm. The same product now incorporated in a plastic uh, window, you can imagine that the glass will perform equally only when the, the uh, window melts away, it has no function. So the, the boundary conditions are very, very important. Mm -hmm. If you don't take into account the boundary conditions uh, which apply to this product, to its intended use, mm -hmm. Well, then you have a high risk of getting claims because you've not excluded them. Mm -hmm. And there you have the legal point again. You mm -hmm. declare a performance about your product. Mm -hmm. If you don't state under which conditions, your statement will be uh, uniformly, well, it will uh, be valid any time. Mm -hmm. You may remember that the lady with her dog in the microwave. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the story, but it's very typical. It was not excluded by the manufacturer. So this lady made a claim. Mm -hmm. If you want to avoid such claims, but because you cannot prove that uh, it will go well, mm -hmm. you just exclude whatever you're not sure of. And that's the legal part of it. You express a performance of the product, but you make a very clear statement on which conditions. Uh, um, this this brings us to a, an, another. Uh, you're, you're touching on a, a another important uh, aspect of um, the CPR, uh, which was also already also in the CPD before that, uh, and that is the role of technical specifications and standards. Um, yeah. Other 
other CE marking directives refer to uh, European harmonized uh, standards. That's uh, we we all are aware of that. But with um, with the CPR and the CPD, the rule is much more stringent. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely true. Um, under the CPD and CPR, you need a reference towards you can assess a product. And that's fair principle. If you don't have something to assess against, you will not be able to make a statement about the products or, in this case, the performance. Exactly, performance, but, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the, the slight problems we have at this moment. Mm -hmm. Over the years, a lot of standards have been developed to make a statement about a product, just the product as it is. And a lot of uh, harmonized standards even though they are harmonized, they're not yet that much developed that you can make a statement about a performance. Okay. And is this something that has to be developed more? Sometimes you can find your way around and get along, mm -hmm. but really making a statement about the performance, uh, a lot of standards need some, some more improvement. Mm -hmm. And typically for the CPR is that you assess against a standard and not so much against a directive uh, in general. Mm -hmm. The construction sector uh, has a lot of different products. You can imagine when, when you're talking about toys, you're just talking about things to be handled by children. If you're talking about a construction product, the, the basic raw material can be different. The origin can be different. It can be a very simple product. It can be a very complex product. It can mm -hmm. be a kit, an assembly of uh, elements. Mm -hmm. The way to assess them might be very different, different. Mm -hmm. and that's why the whole construction sector has been defined in uh, product families, product areas. And if you look at the CPR and really look at uh, the details, look at uh, Annex 4, for example. Mm -hmm. There you see uh, 35 uh, different categories uh, to look at uh, products. Some You can call them general product families. Mm -hmm. Glass is no brick, is no steel, completely different. So the assessment method should be different. The function and the works, the, the intended use, is completely different. Mm -hmm. a, a, a structural bearing by uh, by means of glass is something very, very strange, not, not very ordinary. But steel, instead, we very often use as a steel structure to mm -hmm. give it uh, me mechanical resistance mm -hmm. and stability. So the... The way you look at a product depends on the product itself. It has a different function, so different uh, assessment methods. Mm -hmm. And you can only organize it by creating product families. And even then, if you say we're talking about concrete, anyone would uh, like to know, are you talking about precast concrete? Are you talking about uh, um, pre-stressed elements, uh, what, what kind of concrete. You need some more information. Mm. Otherwise, we do not know what we're talking about. Bricks, you can have uh, very different kinds of bricks. You can have uh, low density, high density. Uh, what, what's the uh, characteristic strength of, of a brick? Mm -hmm. Does it uh, bother me? Yes, it does. You can say this brick has a CE mark. So we get some information about such a product. Mm -hmm. What for do I need it? If you just uh, make a small, low wall around your garden, mm -hmm. you don't give much about the strength of this brick. But if you build a chimney of 30 meters high, then the compressor strength might be very important. Mm -hmm. The information delivered by the manufacturer is the same, but the designer has to understand what this information means. Mm -hmm. And that's why the whole chain is involved. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about something electric, uh, household appliances, mm -hmm. uh, a food processor, what do you do? You open mm -hmm. the box, put it in sockets, and you turn on up and it functions. Mm -hmm. You don't really think, at least I don't. But before you're going to use a product, you have to know what you're looking for, what information is relevant for you. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot more need for uh, education of the architects, the construction companies, whoever is working with those products. Mm -hmm. And and that's one of the 
great uh, challenges for for the next time. Mm -hmm. When do we involve those other parties, those other economic operators, as mm -hmm. you stated very, uh, very clearly? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the CPR, the CPD, um, do not apply to construction products if there is no technical specification. Did I understand that correctly? Um, well, if there is no call, if there is no harmonized standard or technical specification, then then basically the CPD or the CPR does not apply, and you cannot see Emark. Uh, sorry, Han, you're a lawyer, and you know you're just pulling my leg. <laughs> of course, the CPR applies anyway, mm -hmm. anyhow, to mm -hmm. every construction product. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that we do not have a standard yet for each product, mm -hmm. but basically. The construction products regulation applies to each building construction product. Mm -hmm. And we're just waiting till we have the appropriate assessment methods available. Mm -hmm. And the commodities, yes, they have been taken care of by, by standardization. And Sen has done a great job and developed a lot of standards. And everyone involved, mm -hmm. great job. Mm -hmm. But still, a lot has to be done. So, And until that time? Until for a certain product, for a lot of products, there are standards and, and specifications yep. available, but but still for a lot of products, there are no standards, specifications uh, available. What what happens in that case? Well, if you um, think about what I mentioned before, mm. that you're talking about the performance of the building, because you're talking about the performance level of the building, not of the products, but mm -hmm. the final thing you are constructing is a building, mm -hmm. then every product has a certain role in it. Mm -hmm. And if there is no harmonized standard for it, you can just make a statement. Okay. You cannot take a real responsibility because the legal uh, basis is not there yet. Uh, but a lot of manufacturers who have innovative materials, they, they might like to have some kind of CE marking to have the product available to the uh, all countries in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is, of course, a possibility to voluntarily apply for CE marking. One second, one second, one, st one step back. Um, just because I want to make this, this point clear. Basically, what you're saying is, um, if there are no technical specifications or harmonized standards, um, that does not mean that there will not be requirements uh, for the for this product, for how this product performs in, in a building. Um, we would still like this building to be safe and we would like the construction products and materials to contribute to that. However, you cannot leverage the CE marking system where you have a, let's say, harmonized uh, uh, system of uh, performance criteria um, so you you, ha you have no possibility to uh, to take advantage of that, but you still have to uh, show that your product will uh, contribute to the performance that is requirement in the building. Is that well, a, is that an accurate summary? More or less, mm -hmm. um, yes. Who takes the responsibility for a building? So I just uh, return your question. Yeah. Yeah, th the one who is responsible for the building is the one constructing it. it exactly. This, this is another. You're this the another. This is another person. Yes. I mean, the um, the construction products uh, manufacturer is not the one who is designing and putting putting together the building. So he is just um, contributing with a very small piece. Right. Correct. So in the end, the, the safety of the building is the concern of the, the architect and, uh, and the, 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 the project developer who uh, delivers the building. Correct. And they're going to try to use um, those materials of which they can assess or that have uh, of which the uh, performance has been assessed in the, let's say, in the environment and the circumstances that they will have in their building. Well, you I turns around a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, let me rephrase it. When you are constructing a building, then you want to have some information um, about the components you're using. Mm -hmm. If this information is available, you would, will choose 
this uh, product uh, of which you know what it, what you can expect. If this information is not available and you have in mind that you will be responsible for the building and whoever is in it, because if it collapses, uh, you will have some some problem explaining that you've not taken into account the, the risks. If you have this information, which was delivered by a manufacturer who is responsible for the performance he has expressed, mm -hmm. then the liability can be uh, forwarded to the one who has delivered the product to you. So uh, if you like taking chances, well, don't ask for uh, products which have been assessed. If you feel some responsibility, please use those materials about which you have sufficient information that it will function in your works. Mm -hmm. So the architect is involved, but also the construction company. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, the system was started with the, the manufacturers because they were the people who had to uh, draw up this information to make this information available to the market. Mm -hmm. But that, that's exactly what we started off with. Uh, we started with the e-marking coming from the manufacturers. And what was after that? Now the, the uh, people bear in mind, yes, the final uh, construction company has a responsibility which has to be assured. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see at this moment also the, the insurance companies participating in this, in this whole system. Mm -hmm. They are also around the table in Brussels uh, with the European Commission. Mm -hmm. Even last week, uh, I was there participating. Uh, they are aware that if there is uh, trustworthy evidence available, they can reduce their risk because insuring is just making a calculation, risk uh, assessment, what, what is the risk I take? What is the impact of anything going wrong? And if you reduce risk, well, I don't have to explain. Anyone can think, I hope. Yeah. Everybody understands that then the, uh, the cost will be less and, uh, and therefore, yes. uh, yeah. So uh, anyone will try to reduce its, its risk. Mm -hmm. And that's the key issue. I think, uh, Thank you. I think this is uh, this is uh, made very clear. Um, let's move into another um, question um, in, a, in another area altogether. Um, you have been involved in this sector, construction sector, uh, at first, as you explained, as uh, working for a notified body. Uh, so it's also. A, a, certif a certification body as a consultant, but you also worked in the uh, in the industry itself. Um, yep. What, in your experience, are the biggest challenges of uh, of the CE marking, the CE marking system for construction product manufacturers? For the manufacturers, it's not about applying the CE marking. It's, in my opinion, convincing those other parties uh, which use their information that they uh, provide very valuable information. Mm -hmm. As I uh, said about the insurers, about the construction companies, about the architects, very often they don't have a clue what they're asking for. They are just asking about a brick. What kind of brick? They don't know. Maybe they know something about color. But the real importance is they have some information available. Mm -hmm. Use this information and find out which product has, is, uh, is the best choice to, to apply in your works. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the availability of this information. It's about the use of the information they have already provided. Mm -hmm. One of the key points to pay attention to is what I mentioned before the manufacturers now make a declaration of performance make sure that whatever performance you declare that you have sound and solid proof uh, that it will function mm -hmm. if you don't limit uh, your statement to what you can uh, prove please uh, you're in danger mm -hmm. so take care so that, that's a warning towards the manufacturers how, how and a lot of them don't know yet uh, how are you in danger? How are manufacturers in danger? If you just make a declaration of performance without giving any boundary conditions, mm -hmm. you may be held liable for situations you have not foreseen. Mm -hmm. So be very clear in your 
declaration of performance and on which conditions the, this performance is valid mm -hmm. and when it's not assured or uh, not under your declaration of performance. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a warning. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest challenge is now uh, let those other people, those other economic operators join the system. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that's the most important issue. This is this is also something that I see with other directives. Um, in in my view, the the CPR, the CPD are not so different from from other directives. Uh, yes, in its some elements are different, but in in general, the same problems, the same challenges apply. And um, we also see this with machine manufacturers or manufacturers of. E electric uh, equipment, um, if they want to do their job properly, they are investing a lot of time and a lot of money um, because, well, you have to design in compliance, you have to test, you have to ensure uh, and prove that you're in compliance, you have to build your technical file. And once you have done all that and you have the, you know, drawn up your declaration of conformity or performance, uh, um, then the work all, almost starts over again because the regulations and the standards are in development um, and you, there is an ongoing need to keep track of uh, regulatory development. So you constantly have to go back to whether your products are still in compliance. They were maybe two years ago, but the rules may have changed. So um, companies who are doing that invest a lot of time and money in this. Um, and it's not always appreciated by customers because the, the customer is only asking, I would like to see the CE mark on, on your product and and then it's okay but it has to be you know as cheap cheap as possible that's true that's completely true and mm. um, you have to develop and the construction sector is not very well known to be very progressive and um, it's an understatement in my opinion mm -hmm. but if you want to compete in this market because it's all about marketing I make, as a manufacturer, make a statement about the performance of my product. My competitor also makes a statement about the performance of his product. Mm -hmm. They can be easily compared. Then what product will be chosen by someone who is in charge of making the decision? He will look at, of course, the price, mm -hmm. but also look at the, the level of performance. If they are equal, then it will be the price, which, which is the decision. Mm -hmm. If you have two statements about your product, you can use it under these circumstances. And also in other circumstances, you have an advantage over your competition. Because anyway, the manufacturers will be challenged to develop information about a product, to improve the product, to set higher performances, to declare them. But in order to declare them, they have to be sure that those performances they declare are real, mm -hmm. can be trusted. Mm -hmm. So there is a very strong uh, mechanism of marketing uh, behind it. Mm -hmm. And people don't seem to realize that they are challenged mm -hmm. each day over and over again. Look at your competition. Are they gaining uh, in, uh, in re respect to you, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's just the market functioning as it should. Mm -hmm. so if you look at that, no, no, just, just one thing I, I have mm -hmm. to, to sure. uh, say. Right. Has anyone ever heard of the paper COM85? It's a paper written by the commission. And it was written in 85. That's why it's called 85. Mm -hmm. And it has a special title completing the internal market. It's mm -hmm. all about those economic um, possibilities, those targets to let the uh, companies work, make progress, challenge each other, improve quality, improve trade. Mm -hmm. And that's behind it. And if we forget this, we will never improve. We will just make whatever we have made before. We will be uh, building castles like uh, centuries ago. Mm -hmm. Well, some of It's a new age. Yeah. Uh, so basically what you are saying is manufacturers should embrace this system um, 
take their responsibilities, and then they will be able to take advantage of this system. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. If you don't take this opportunity, you will be out of business in no time. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, to the next point, to the next step. So manufacturers are ready. They are convinced by your story. We have to embrace these, these, uh, this new regulation. We have to uh, find the technical specifications and standards, and we have to make sure that we can declare performance in accordance with these. Um, how, how would they go about? What are the next steps for them to, to implement this, uh, to make their pro products compliant? And in addition to that, what in your experience are the biggest hurdles for manufacturers when they are ready to um, make their products compliant? The first thing you have to do as a manufacturer is know what uh, you're producing. What is your product? determine your product. In fact, the regulation is quite clear about it. They use the term product type determination. That's mm -hmm. uh, where you start off with. Mm -hmm. Determine what kind of product you make. Then you'll have uh, information about the performance of the product, mm -hmm. about in which way it is uh, going to be applied in the works. Mm -hmm. This information you have, you determine the performance, uh, you can do it either yourself or involve an external body. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this may be a point we, we have to raise at this moment. Sometimes we, we, talk, we talked about risk uh, of products involved. If you have a no uh, level risk product, then anyone can use it. There's no, no big rush about it. Mm -hmm. But if, you, for example, uh, take the, the fire resistant glass. It's intended to provide some safety in uh, in a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. Then you want to be very very sure that it will function. And in such cases, there is the, uh, a mandatory involvement of an external body, mm -hmm. making this de determination of the product type, determining the uh, performance of the product, and even uh, sometimes certify in time that the product remains and keeps its its performance as it was intended uh, when you first uh, assess the product. Mm -hmm. So there are levels. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very easy. The manufacturer can do it himself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, an external body has to be hired to have a uh, formal role in it. Mm -hmm. And this, this is defined mm -hmm. also in, in the harmonized standard. You mm -hmm. can find it in the Annex ZA. Mm -hmm. There's also, a, also always a description which, which are the roles and the tasks for a manufacturer and which are the tasks for a notified body, as we call them. Mm -hmm. w one second to, to, to recap on this. So the first step is basically you defined as a manufacturer, and this is your responsibility, but it's also it gives you also a, 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 a level of freedom, is you define what the intended purpose of your product is. <coughs> Right. And once you have defined what your intended purpose is, then you're going to look at which requirements apply to that particular intended purpose. If you don't know your product, you cannot make a statement about mm -hmm. your product. Yeah. So first you have to know your product. And, mm -hmm. and well, you have to define it also. I mean, you yeah. can you can say I make glass, uh, but you can maybe also say we make fire resistant glass. That's different kinds yeah. of glasses at different kinds of intended purpose. So um, that, that is what I, what I mean to say is by, by defining your intended purpose, you, uh, you're ready to go to the next step is to define for this particular intended purpose, what are the requirements that apply? Mm -hmm. And from that moment you go, go further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, don't forget you're now using the words intended use and mm -hmm. the words intended use under the CPD were slightly different than it is under the CPR. Mm -hmm. Under the CPD, you had the, um, the you addressed the intended uses in the standards. You're going to use this in, uh, in uh, circumstances, uh, safety in case of fire, fire resistance. That was an intended use. Now you describe an intended use under the CPR as uh, providing 
a, a separation between the inner and outer climate. It's mm -hmm. a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. Because what we previously uh, called intended use is now, in, in fact, a performance, a characteristic, an essential characteristic which can be uh, declared by a performance. Mm -hmm. So th there are some changes. We uh, use the same words, but the meaning is different. Mm -hmm. And you have to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. You have defined your intended uh, use. and. Um now you're looking at the requirements and you're looking at which procedures do I have to follow in order to declare my performance, correct? Um, there are several uh, routes that are made available to manufacturers. Can you explain a little bit about that? You were, you were touching about, uh, upon that, uh, referring to declaring it yourself versus going to a third party. Um, can you explain a little bit about um, that procedure? Yeah. Uh, the most common procedure is that you look in the standard. Mm -hmm. And depending uh, the performance you want to declare, you find in the Annex ZA if there is a need for a third party involvement. And there you will find the, until now, it's all, uh, always called the AOC system the attestation of conformity, mm -hmm. which does not no longer exist under the CPR. Now we're talking about the assessment and verification of constancy of performance. It's a long word, I know, mm -hmm. I will repeat it. Assessment and verification of constancy of performance. Mm -hmm. Write it down, read it carefully, <laughs> because it has a very important meaning. Mm -hmm. It is about the performance of the product, and it's about the constancy of performance. It, that means that when you make a statement about the performance of your product, it has to be trustworthy over time. Mm -hmm. It has to be trusted every time. You can't say, I made a declaration. Oh, I'm sorry, this one just dropped out, this one uh, fails. No, you have taken the responsibility. So your performance shall be assured any any time. Mm -hmm. But before you can make this uh, constancy of performance, you would need to assess it the first time. What is the performance? Mm -hmm. So define what is the performance, mm -hmm. yes, that is the assessment. And then over time, you will make sure that it is, it is assured. Mm -hmm. So that's the assessment and verification of constancy of performance. So this was a sidestep. Yeah. Um, and this has to be assured. And you, it is always the responsibility of the manufacturer to uh, comply to whatever he has declared. And that's mm -hmm. the strong point of this regulation. Yes. And he makes a statement and he is responsible for it. He is liable when he is not in line. And, but as I said, mm -hmm. in certain uh, areas, there is a higher risk. Mm -hmm. And then you don't trust just the manufacturer because he says so. You need the involvement of the third party, which can mean uh, a certification body or just a test institute or mm -hmm. combination. So there are different levels. So what you are saying is um, the manufacturer is responsible, but that does not mean that um, he does everything himself. There, there are right. cases in which he involves a third party. Maybe even he has to involve a third party. Yes. Yes. But he's still, in the end, the person that is responsible for compliance. Yes. And so, that's why it is called assessment and verification of constancy of performance, because the manufacturer is responsible for the establishment of the, the performance declaration. Mm -hmm. That he needs sometimes the mm -hmm. information from a third party, an independent mm -hmm. third party, that it's just part of the deal. Mm -hmm. If this assessment is made by another party, mm -hmm. still the manufacturer is responsible for the declaration. Mm -hmm. And that's the legal point of view. You cannot just um, uh, trans uh, move this, this responsibility to the third party. That would be easy. Uh, and that, 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 would, that, would that was be... the perception under the, uh, the construction products uh, directive. Yes, and it's, it's, it's a perspective. Pers uh, uh, 
it's the idea that a lot of manufacturers have is when, as soon as they go to a third party, they think, OK, now it's their responsibility. We we just pay them and they will give us a certificate and um, uh, now we are good to go. But yes, it is very important to realize that the manufacturer remains responsible. And that despite it is a very, the, for, for it, so go ahead. Yeah, they remain responsible despite mm -hmm. uh, that they had to hire an external party. Mm -hmm. And and there is a very good reason for for uh, for building that into the system, that element in, into the system, because there is only one person that takes the decision: we will put this product on the market, or we will not put this product on the market, and that is the manufacturer. Yes, and in fact, that's the one who signs the declaration of performance mm -hmm. in person, because he's in person liable for any defect. Even in case of fraud, he will go to uh, prison or be uh, sentenced or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's very uh, man-focused. One person is in charge, and it's not the company. It's just the one mm -hmm. person signing this, this performance uh, declaration. Is there? Could you say something maybe in general? Is are there uh, about which type of products are typically? Uh, have to be assessed uh, with the involvement of third parties and which products can be self-assessed? Is, the, is there anything to say about that? Well, that is rather difficult mm -hmm. um, because there are a few mechanisms behind it mm -hmm. uh, from the past because some countries had a background in uh, certification, either national certification or voluntary certification, whatever, mm -hmm. but they all had certain id uh, about it mm -hmm. the one who is deciding about the uh, uh, mandatory involvement of a third party is the european commission mm -hmm. they make a, a survey around the member states what do you think is uh, appropriate and they make their own minds up uh, yes we're talking by, about a high risk product mm -hmm. so we set the level for external involvement very high. Mm -hmm. If it's a low risk pro product, you, you can imagine paint uh, for uh, just the color. Does it have a very high risk? You're talking just about color. Of, of course, you can think about dangerous Chemical, substances, yeah. but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not have a real a mechanical function yes. in the building. It's maybe uh, a, De decorative. Uh, yeah. Decorative, just some preservation of the, of the material mm -hmm. uh, beneath it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but is that a really high risk? If the, the paint goes away, just paint it over. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about products which provide um, uh, some, some safety against uh, yeah, impacts, high impact, explosion impact, mm -hmm. uh, fire, uh, safety in case of fire, if you're talking about mechanical uh, structures, uh, why is there such a, a lot to do about the EN uh, 1090? I don't know. You may have heard about this <laughs> standard. It's about steel structures. Mm -hmm. And because they are load bearing structures. Yeah. And if something collapses, you have quite a problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then the involvement of third party is very uh, nearby. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, in the member states, there were some certification schemes which had also their requirements. And some countries have uh, schemes in which anything uh, needs involvement of third party mm -hmm. uh, because it assures the customer. Well, well, that's a tough topic. I'm not going to touch it here yeah. because we need another two hours. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm dealing a little bit with that. Uh, as you know, uh, currently uh, working in, in, in Russia and Moscow, um, here what we see is, is in their system of technical regulation, almost everything needs to be certified by a third party. And uh, uh, I think this is one of the, the, the good things um, of the European Union system is that uh, we, we, we try to regulate safety, but at the same time, we don't lose track. We, we keep an eye on uh, the importance of not creating barriers for economic activity and don't make it more difficult for the economic operators than necessary and strictly necessary. And I think this is something that, um, um, yeah, a lot of regulators can take uh, uh, an example 
can, can take the European example. That's correct. And uh, I think you're completely right in this respect. Um, the system developed now in Europe just uh, involves third parties when there is really a risk and a need to involve them. And it's not mandatory if there is a low risk. So don't assess and don't uh, increase the charges unless there's a real reason to it. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea. Um, we came pretty much to the end uh, of, of the interview, but maybe, maybe we can talk a few minutes because we didn't touch upon this. Um, we, we spoke about assessment of, uh, of construction products. But there are different kinds of assessments that need to take place. There is the um, what a lot of manufacturers have in mind, the traditional product testing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you uh, also referred to proving consistency. Um, and maybe you can touch a little bit uh, in a few minutes, you can touch a little bit about uh, on that. Um, this, this requirement for a factory production control system. Can you explain a little bit what that entails? Yeah, um, because you're responsible as a manufacturer for the statement you make in your declaration of performance. Mm -hmm. You have to assure that whatever you're producing will live up to it. Mm -hmm. That means that you need some kind of internal quality system to, to have this insurance in place. So that's always a task for the manufacturer to have it in place. A lot of standards give some definitions about what should be in it, some more detailed than others. Some just say that you have to have some kind of factory production control. So that's always an obligation for the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, even um, if you have this in place, there, there could be uh, products which uh, fall in a class with a high risk where, for which it's reasonable to have an external survey on this, uh, whatever the manufacturer is doing, mm -hmm. the factory production control. And that's more the classical way of certification, mm -hmm. assess the system. You can compare it a little bit to system certification mm -hmm. because you're just looking at the system. Is it functioning, yes or no? Is that system like in ISO quality system? Uh, for example, and some standards even make the statement, if you have in place a system, um, as ISO 9000 uh, dedicated to the topics of this standard, mm -hmm. it can be uh, assumed that it's functioning. Mm -hmm. So if you have placed it under an ISO 9000, uh, that could be possible, mm -hmm. but it has to be specific to the product you're manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe... but, but there are some circumstances where you're not just mm -hmm. having this external certification of your factory production control, mm -hmm. but also about whatever the product is really performing. So it could be external testing also, or witness testing by the certification body. Mm -hmm. That's a, a more severe regime, but it can be applied or can be mandatory in those high risk uh, products. Okay. Where will the manufacturer find out which procedure applies to his situation? He has to look in the standard. As I said before, the Annex ZA, uh, there you will find tables. Very often it's the, the ZA1 in which is defined which uh, levels uh, do apply. And sometimes you see a deviation. It's level one, level three, or level four. And it depends on the intended use or the, the essential characteristics about the products you want to declare. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because what is essential about this product? What does it perform? You can make the statement, uh, no performance determined. If you say plus uh, resistance to fire, no performance determined, then there's no involvement of a third party in that respect. Mm -hmm. Other um, performances when declared, other essential characteristics, they may require just once external testing or not even a notified body involved. So mm -hmm. look at the Annex ZA. There you will find the information. So to, to recap, you would start by defining the intended uh, use for your product. You would then take the next step to find to try to find European harmonized standards or technical specifications, 
when you have found them, uh, when you have found standards, for example, you look specifically in Annex ZA uh, of this uh, standard to find requirements, uh, performance criteria, and the procedures which you have to follow to, uh, to prove compliance. Uh, you'll read there whether you can do self-assessment or whether you need to involve a third party. And if you need to involve a third party, uh, what this third party needs to do. Um, that's basically it. Uh, you need to have a factory control system, but this will also be uh, defined in uh, the same Annex ZA. Um, so when you come to that point, well, then you have everything uh, uh, everything that you need to start your conformity assessment, correct? Yes, but it's that basically simple and, and normal. Any manufacturer shall have some control over his production. So he shall have a look at the way he is producing. Mm -hmm. If he has a rejection of his uh, produced products of 50%, he is not very economic. So he will think, how can I uh, reduce the amount of rejects I have? So it's very normal to have some kind of uh, factory production control in place. Mm -hmm. If you see something's going wrong, you're not going to uh, correct at the end. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to correct at the stage where the uh, deviation occurs. So it's from an economic point of view, very normal to have some control system over your uh, factory production. Mm -hmm. It's quite simple, but the details will be given in the standard. Mm -hmm. but, but before you start with uh, finding your way around, there is a very good document available on internet, and it's updated every uh, once in a while, and I guess two times a year. Mm -hmm. It's the SEN snapshot. Mm -hmm. You can just Google it, you can find it, and you will see which uh, harmonized standards have been published in the official journal, which mm -hmm. do apply. Mm -hmm. And you see a very uh, brief description in the title. Mm -hmm. Yes, that could be interesting, but if you have to buy all the standards, it will be quite a costly business. Mm -hmm. So you will try to avoid that one. Mm -hmm. So look at, uh, try to Google at uh, send snapshots. Mm -hmm. Then you know which uh, standards could apply for your product. And if you want to find a notified body which can help you with whatever uh, the, their tasks that are defined, mm -hmm. go to uh, NANDO, this uh, database of the European Union, and there you can find all the institutes which are designated to perform those tasks as an official institute. Mm -hmm. So I call again NANDO mm -hmm. for the notified bodies and the send snapshots to find out about the harmonized standards. That's great, uh, Harm. I, uh, I propose that we will link to these documents, uh, uh, to the database and to the document uh, in our show notes and uh, maybe here somewhere in annotations and on YouTube. Um, the, the time just passed too quickly. Uh, we have been uh, talking for, well, uh, for very long. So um, we, we have to uh, um, stop the interview here. Um, but I have a suggestion uh, for you. Uh, request uh, to come back uh, for another interview for another show um, and I would like to ask you the audience to send your questions to Harm Verster uh, about the CPR the CPD which procedures uh, you have to follow what will be the next step when you are coming to this point where you're ready to do conformity assessment um, and so in the next interview we, we can take your questions and uh, we can uh, we can include them into the uh, uh, discussion. Um, you can send those questions uh, to me. My email address will appear here uh, as well. You can also leave a voice message uh, using our voicemail system at cemarking.net forward slash voicemail. Record your message and then we can play it in the next uh, interview and then Harm can answer your questions. So please do send in those questions. Um, uh, Harm, um, I hope to uh, discuss with you uh, uh, the viewers' questions uh, very soon. Thank you very much for this interview, for taking the time, and uh, hope to talk to you very soon. Goodbye. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for this interview. 
And yes, we have uh, developed the system for over two decades. So those uh, topics cannot be answered in just half an hour. I guess we need some more specific questions. And yes, I'm very willing to answer them if I can help you. That's great. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Good night.